just a reminder, you, you are going to be getting one of these uh, merely to uh, take with you, keep, and it'll make more sense as we go throughout this service. We today are taking two offerings. One is our regular offering, heads up for the ushers. One is our regular offering first. And then a little later on in this service, we are taking a community uh, offering for um, our teachers back to school breakfast and also for our Heroes Day. So just to give you a, a heads up on that. Over the history of Israel, the Jewish nation, at different times, they faced extinction, as you know. And there were various... There were various rulers who just had it in their mind to destroy them. And on one such occasion, there was a woman in the Old Testament that God called to stand up and answer the call on behalf of her nation and be used in a mighty way for his purposes. And we find it in this book called Esther. And you can read this uh, on your own just um, in the book of Esther. But just briefly, I want to share Esther chapter 4, verse 14, uh, which says, and this is a man speaking to Esther when God is calling her to to step out and do something for her people. He says this, For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time. Is this Jeff? Can we project uh, on my um, Mac this time? Or is that is that working? Esther chapter four, verse fourteen. Two points that I want to make here at the beginning, and that is that God moves, but He always seems to move through people. And at the beginning here of this statement, it's the idea that if we don't stand up and accept the challenge when God moves through us or through Esther on this occasion, that God is going to still move. He's just going to move at another time and somewhere else through someone else. So the question is put at the end there, do you think... That God is so big that before we even have a chance to live on this earth, before we breathe the first breath of life, do you think God has such a plan for us that there are times uh, that could be described as such a time as this when God says, it's you, I want you to stand up and make a difference for me. In 1918, this congregation was started. The founding pastors, Pastor George Lewis, um, started, they started to meet in faith in some homes here in Ithaca. Pastor Lewis started in his home, and then it went to some other homes until finally a church, a, a a building was built, and it was simply referred to as the chapel. But it was the Church of God in Ithaca, and this building still can be found. It's at Emerson and St. John's Road, although it looks different now, but the structure is still there. And that's where this church first began under the direction of Pastor George Lewis. And then in the mid-'60s, they... Uh, changed locations, and by faith, 
moved here to this building. And I just happened to have a picture of 71 because it was convenient for me. But this is a group of people. This is a pastor who at that point in their life, God was saying, I want to move in this town, in this city, and this is your for such a time as this. Will you step up and be counted for such a time as this? Curious to know how many might have been in that picture in 1971. Just raise your hands, okay? See? These are for such a time as this people. And so are we. It's my privilege to invite for a, a few moments Jonathan Lewis, who is the grandson of George Lewis. Jonathan, would you, would you come on up and and have a seat here. Jonathan has been worshiping with us for a while, and you might not even have met Jonathan, but he is the grandson of the founding pastor of our church. Good to see you, sir. Thank you. So how long have you been worshiping with us now? It's been a few months? Uh, probably been about a year now. I've yeah. actually attended on a regular basis. One slight did I miss? Uh, Go ahead. Correction. Yes, here. please correct. Um, this is the biblical spelling of my name. Aha. Uh -huh. And uh, that's not the way it is. Okay, so but we want to. That's wanna... okay. Okay. I've, I've answered to a lot worse. All right. <laughs> at, at least I didn't call you a Johnny or something like that. Okay. Well, when I was a kid. Most okay, of all right. Um, it says you're semi retired on this. Yes. So. And uh, I am expanding my horizons to meet new people. Yes. To do different things. Um, I'm not strange to Ithaca because after, well, I, I graduated Central to be a woodshop teacher. And I didn't have the confidence back then. And I didn't have him on my side. Yes. So... I'm wanna, a little more confident now sure. than I was back then. Good. I want to ask you just a, a couple questions, just for a few moments. Yes. Uh, um, you have talked to me a little bit about the character and the personality um, of your grandfather, and that's something that, that has uh, resonated with me. Uh, one thing that was that he was just such a positive person and really didn't have a bad word to say about anyone. Could you share a little bit about that? Certainly. Uh, I remember Grandpa as being a very mild-mannered man, uh, doting on my younger brother and sister, rocking them in the rocking chairs, which I have at my house, mm -hmm. uh, reading to them, and Saturday night was watch the TV wrestling and popcorn and apples. TV wrestling is that what you? I Grandma yes. loved okay. and could not. Are you saying our our founding pastor watched? Big time wrestling? It, it probably was more grandma's. Uh, okay, all right. That's cool. That's fine. I just curious. Okay, go ahead. Um, there's a couple of things, uh, instances that I've been, you know, family tales, like my Aunt Hazel told me, which was George, George and Effie's second daughter. Um, one day, grandpa came home. And he heard the girls gossiping together. Mm. Grandpa got a little irritated by listening to it and said, you know, if you don't have something good to mm. say about someone, maybe you shouldn't say it at all. Mm. And Grandpa returned, retorted back and said, well, he does work awfully hard. Because mm. <laughs> you're talking, he the, the was it your grandmother then that said something about your, your grandfather would, would not even say something bad about, about the devil? Is that kind of the idea? Okay. Yeah, I, I, I missed something. That's there, okay. I? Well, I misspelled your name. Grandma so. said, <laughs> Grandma said, you'd have something good to say about the devil now, there, wouldn't you? Yeah. And Grandpa said, he does work awfully hard. Yes. 
<laughs> could now you, just, you got it. <laughs> could you just tell me one more thing? You were, you were talking to me about um, your your grandfather and how he would he would have a suit on, and how he was was sitting in there. You, you, you want to tell me that? Um, I don't know if anyone here remembers Jasper Reinard. He was here in town, and I guess he sold tires uh, before or during the war. And he was a family friend. And uh, actually, I think he bought the TV that Grandma was watching mm. originally. Um, oh, he I know. Was sitting on like Jasper the told a, told me the story about he was in awe of. Reverend George Lewis, because his dad would come into town off the farm, sit at the park bench in front of the courthouse with his dirty manure shoes on. Grandpa's dressed in his uh, good clean attire, and that didn't bother Grandpa at all that he had manure on his boots. He was just another human being, one of God's human beings, yep. wore all his creation because your grandfather really believed that everyone is valuable every, no matter what they're wearing or what their past is yes. and so that's the heart of uh, the one who's who actually started the work here I'm very humbled yeah. to be following in mm -hmm. his footsteps I do want to help yeah. make a difference wow. um, he started something wonderful here I mm -hmm. think that this is a church of all ages. Mm -hmm. This is a growing yes. church. Mm -hmm. This is not a dying church. And I, this is what I've been looking for. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Thank sir. You. Give a hand for uh, Jonathan. Thank you for being with us. And it's great to have um, his connection. And it's so wonderful to have so many of you who are who, who were part in your lifetime already of a for such a time as this moment where God says, I'm doing something and I've created you, I've made you for such a time as this and you said yes and you've been part of this work that has gone on all of these years. Esther, for such a time as this. But that was just Esther. That's just like in the Old Testament days. Or, like, amen, amen. Or that was just 1918. Or that was just 1971. Or it's 2018. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. And this is, this is interesting to me, which God prepared in advance for us to do. In advance means that before we were born, God was thinking not only of a life and how we would look and act and not what our DNA would be, but God was thinking, what will they do for me for such a time as this? Doris, do you remember this? Yeah. This is one of the original pieces of pallet wood that I pulled um, out because it was, it was a, little, a little more used than the rest of them. But this is what started our welcome center, these types of pieces of wood, all kinds of wood, um, uh, but they're, they're kind of, in all honesty, sort of scrap pieces. But somebody had an idea to find a good use for them, and so they were made into pallet wood. And then, later on, 
God had a use in his church for it. And so Doris and uh, Koppelbergers and others cleaned these things up. And we started to use them in our church building itself. And so the Welcome Center was built out of scrap pieces of wood that were redeemed, let's say, for the causes of God, like God's handiwork. And then wood pieces like here, our pallet board, and over there, and over there. Pallet board, kind of like you and I, just odd and in handiworks of God. Maybe kind of rough. Maybe others might not think could be used for much, but oh, in the hands of God. And this thought that God prepared in advance. He had this idea that you and I would be his handiwork. And so our latest handiwork, these three people spent hours here this week and uh, a couple burgers were cutting and Dean was fitting in all of those pieces in our now our new welcome uh, sign up um, area which is made out of pallet wood all of those pieces are have to be put in there like a puzzle different shapes different sizes come from different who knows where those, that wood originally started with, except it was just thrown onto a pallet board and now fit into a beautiful handiwork for God's use. And you have been given today a piece of the pallet wood that was used in that, the, 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 the very wood, just some of them that were left over, because this represents you this represents your puzzle piece, however it's shaped, whatever your background is, whatever your age is. This represents you. Part of the palette, the beauty of this congregation, as God in his handiwork has designed you for this time and this moment for such a time as this. On the 16th is our prayer garden dedication. We're, we're starting off with uh, that, that weekend of the 8th and the 9th, and then and, and we're looking toward um, you know the, the centennial and all of that, and then we're going to come out of that and go into the next Sunday, which is the 16th. And we are going to talk about a new prayer garden that is uh, just in the early stages right now of being constructed. And um, we're hoping that by that time on the 16th, it'll be finished. And the prayer garden has to do with uh, honoring uh, the memories of people that have not only live before us, but still live today, just celebrating lives. And they are representative. We certainly can't put all the, those people that we're thinking of in this area, but those bricks that will be in there will be remembering and celebrating the lives that have lived and still live today as pallet board pieces. Let me tell you a little bit about this structure that is just... Uh, the beginning. Uh, by the way, uh, a big thank you to Greg Sherman for donating his craftsmanship on uh, building the the seat and and the arbor. And um, I know that uh, the the donation of the plants they're going to be coming in, and even the cost of the seat and, and this um, has been donated by the Godleys, and we appreciate that. But I want to I want to read. Uh, some of what this is going to be by the 16th. And 
please understand that the whole idea of plants and flowers and stuff is out of my realm of understanding. So I'm going to be reading words that uh, are unfamiliar to me, and I really have no idea what I'm talking about, but some of you will. So I'm just going to read it for you. This will contain, talking about the prayer garden, this will contain plants around the seating area. The clematis. Well, it wasn't early. The clematis, whatever that is, some kind of flower, will be four different flowering plants of pink, purple, hot pink, and white. The clematis is staged to grow up the prayer bench on the trellis and flower in stages from spring to fall. Flocks, yes. not like flocks of lambs, because that's, that's what I would have thought, because the next word is lamb's ear. <laughs> These are all plants, right? Not literal flocks and lamb's ears, but these are plants. Flocks, lamb's ear, orange tulips, and daffodils will be included. The area will be planted and then mulched by uh, by the seating area, and a cross will be inlaid in the ground in the front of the area. Edging and mat will be used to control weeds and easy care for the building and ground. Possible other plants will be added, uh, but, but kept grouped to their species for easy care and control. The lilies have been saved back to plant in the area. I don't even know what that means, saved back. Oh, that were there before. Good thinking. So that's they're going to be saved back. And they're going to be used. And in that picture, there is a ledge um, on that side. And that area needs to be filled with the same flowers to fill that in. So I figured that those could go there because there's already some there and they could be grouped together. So they've been saved back, haven't they? To plant in that area that in, uh, so it's going to be, whatever. Our, our engraved bricks that we are, that many of you have, have ordered and still can, can order for, uh, when is the last date on that that they can? We're looking for the 23rd because it's going to take four weeks okay. to get them back. Okay. So I'd like to and note that the lilies have been saved back. But the engraved bricks, we're signing up for those if you want them. I think they're $35 a piece, and they're, they're in, in memory of, again, those that are living and those that have, have uh, gone on before us. But, but it's cool. I, I've already sat out there um, thinking of the lilies that have been saved back, and just it's really neat. It's going to be very, very special. So that is... That is our uh, prayer garden, and we are going to dedicate that. Yeah. Yes. And then I also received some paintings that were donated um, from some of our people here that are also going to be um, in the front along the side. Wow. Well. The Bradley, yeah. Those are flowers? Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. If you want to help out, if you want to help out in this project, you can see Diane or, or the Godleys, and uh, the, I know that they need more help in planting and clearing out things and preparing for the things that are, have been saved back. Um, now, that's the 16th. This has been one of my favorite books over the years of my ministry called Experiencing God. Um, by uh, Henry Blackaby. And I have taught this not only in churches, in small groups, uh, but I've also taught it in prisons. I used to meet on a Wednesday evening um, in uh, Indianapolis, and I, I would, at, I think at like 9 o'clock in the evening, 
I would go and I would meet with about 15 prisoners. Um, and we would go through this book together in a county jail. And it is a tremendous book about how to know God, how to see him at work, and then when he is working to answer the call as palette pieces. Answer the call of for such a time as this. So I wanted to give you some of the quotes that are in this book that I remember as I've looked back over it now. Here's one of them. Will God ever ask you to do something you are not able to do? The answer is yes. All the time. It must be that way for God's glory and kingdom. If we function according to our ability alone, we get the glory. If we function according to the power of the Spirit within us, God gets the glory. He wants to reveal himself to a watching world. You know, God could do so many things to get his word across and who he is. I mean, God could have all of these miraculous, like, um, images appear of him all throughout the world and through life. And just like he could just pop up and, and show who he is and all these messages he could give with all of his creativity. But instead of doing that, you know what he does to get his word out? He decides that he will get his word out through pallet board. Because when a pallet board is transformed, then you've got something amazing. If God does it, we say, well, that's God. Of course God can do that. But if a pallet board makes beauty, then you've got something. Another quote. The reality is that the Lord never calls the qualified. He qualifies the call. We don't choose what we will do for God. He invites us to join him where he wants to involve us. I'm not qualified. I've never been qualified. And I'll just go out on a limb and say, neither are you. Because I'm at heart and never will be any more than an old pallet board. That God got a hold of. But I am not qualified. God qualifies me and God qualifies you. And furthermore, we don't decide where God works. I or the leaders or you don't say, we've got a great plan. Now, God, won't you come over here and join us? But instead, it's God that gets working. And it's up to us to say, God's working. Let's go there. And sometimes, frankly, he works fast. And he works faster than my ability to even explain it or share it ahead of time. Sometimes it just, God works. And man, does he work. And it's like, just hold on. And every now and then, I come up here and share things that you haven't even seen yet. And I'm just kind of figuring it out. And I'm saying there's a structure out there, a prayer garden that you may not have seen yet. But it's here and God's working. And some of you see stuff going out out there, going on. And it wasn't like that last week. And all I can say is that sometimes... That's how God works, and he works fast. And it's up to us then to just say, if you're working, and you obviously are, I'm going to join you, just my pallet board stuff, me. I'm going to join you. There was a church in Asia Minor minor, uh, called Philadelphia, the church at Philadelphia. And they got a 
a, a message. And this is in Revelation 3, 7. It says, To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. And what he opens, this is Jesus, what Jesus opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. Now, this should come as no surprise to us because Jesus is God. And what, what God opens, of course, only he can open and no one can shut it. It's this idea that the, the door or whatever, however God is moving, is so big that no human being could ever open that door of opportunity. And then once it's open, no human being can shut it. Because it's God and God's door. So that comes as no surprise. But the interesting part is he goes on in verse 8 and he says, I know your deeds, church. I know what you're doing, church. And Look, here's an interesting part. It's not only God can open doors, but God opens doors for churches. And God opens doors for people who are just pallet boards. God opens doors. For such a time as this, see, I've placed before you an open door that no one can shut. Oh, I know you have little strength. You're not the biggest. You don't have the most influence. You're not the wealthiest. Ah, but you know what you do? You do well at keeping my name. You make sure that it's about God. It's about loving others, and it's about your community. You do well at making sure that people know it's about Jesus. You've not denied my name. So I'm going to open a door. I'm opening a door that no one can shut. And all I'll say about this area in conclusion is that someday, I believe, and our leaders believe, however this looks, however it works out, we don't have any idea when or any of that. We just know that somehow, some way, someday, that there'll be something else on the rest of this property not for us, but for the community, because we are all about the community. It's God, and it's loving others, and it's the community. So certainly we will use it. Certainly it'll be used by us, but it'll be for the community. It'll be for the schools. It'll be for uh, the, the city. It'll be something for this community. When and how, I don't know exactly, but the leaders just believe that and know that back in the, when this church was built here, that the plans were somehow that there'd be something out there. Now we know it's a, it's a place gate, but there's something else too, however God works, that there'll be something there for this community. I don't know the exact details yet or how that's going to work, but just be praying. Just be open because when God opens a door and God has moments that are such a time as this, and if we don't do things, God's going to do it through someone else. And when he opens a door, no one can shut it. For such a time as this.